Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. It's Tori and today I'm going to have a spoilery filled chat with you guys about Red Seas Under Red Skies, which is the sequel to The Lies of Locke Lamora, the second book in the Gentleman Bastard series. We are going to talk about this. If you want a spoiler free overview of my opinion of Lies of Locke Lamora, which is the first book in this series, I will link that down below in the comments so that you can go watch that because if you haven't read the first book yet, the only reason I am not reading book three right now and I'm making this video is because book three isn't here. It's not coming until tomorrow and I can't handle it. So I fell in love with The Lies of Locke Lamora about a week and a half ago when I read it, finished it, I'd been reading it as a buddy read, and then I jumped right into book number two because I fell in love with Locke and Jean and all the other characters in Lies of Locke Lamora who, and I'm only going to say this one more time, this is a spoiler filled chat. So if you haven't read this book, leave now or forever hold your peace. All the other characters basically die at the end of book one, and so we are left with Locke and Jean. Locke and Jean have fled Camor because they are wanted men, and Donia Varchenza basically told them, if you come back, I'm going to throw you to the devilfish. And so Jean and Locke go to a completely different country to try to make their fortune in the only way that they know, which is con art and thievery. They go to Tal Varar, and this place is kind of dominated by two major power sources. One is the Sin Spire, which is basically a giant casino, and the second one is the Mon Magisteria, which is the fortress of the Archon, who's kind of like the naval general who protects the city. So these are two, the kind of two like major powers in the city. And of course Locke and Jean get into a scenario where they are conning both at the same time, while also being conned by both at the same time. It's a mess. Like, okay, I will say that in book one, Locke and Jean, like, it was all very tangled up and there were multiple pieces moving around. This book, I was having a hard time keeping track. We time jump quite a bit and it was more jarring for me in book two than it was for me in book one. I didn't enjoy it as much in book two. However, the information that Scott Lynch was presenting to us in the time jumps backwards were relevant. And so I can't really say, oh, take them out because they were good. It was just really jarring because so many things were happening at once. And it wasn't like, in book one, we were going from present day Locke to Locke as a small boy. That's a lot different than Locke now, Locke like six months ago. Okay, now here's where we're gonna get into talking about specifics. So this is gonna get spoilery. So again, if you're still here, okay. In the very beginning of this book, when Locke is so upset about the death of Kahlo and Galdo and Bug, and he's just kind of given up on life. He's turned to drinking, and he's basically sitting alone in this hotel room by himself, getting drunk and trying to disappear from the world. And Gene is going out there, and he's trying to, like, set up a new crew. He's trying to get their life back in order, and he's actually being an adult. I wouldn't necessarily say that Locke is any kind of an adult in most instances. Um, Jean is definitely the adult in this situation and Locke is kind of the petulant child if we're really honest with ourselves. The scene where Jean comes back and he finally has had enough. He's just done. Locke, you are not gonna sit here and drink yourself into oblivion anymore. You're done. We're gonna get the Thorn of Kamor back because this is, I'm over it. Those like six to ten pages where Jean gets under Locke's skin and pulls him out of that depressive pit is probably my favorite scene in the two books combined yet. It was, I cried. It was so powerful and it was such a good friends pulling each other out of hard situations and like Gene not giving up on Locke, even though honestly he had a lot of reasons to. Now they're gambling at the Sin Spire and they're trying to con the man who owns the entire operation. They're slowly working up through the levels of like elitism that exists within the Sin Spire and they're trying to get to the man at the top and basically con him out of a bunch of his valuables. Then they get brought in with the Archon 
and the Archon wants them to basically fake pirate attacks on the city of Talvarar so that the people will beg the Archon to come back and save them so that he can gain more power. And he knows way too much about Locke and Jean because of the Bonds Mage Guild, I guess, in Carthane, who's been, no pun intended, a thorn in their side since book one. I didn't think that the villains were as strong in this book as they were in book one. The Grey King, but even more so, the Bonds Mage, the Falconer in book one, he was creepy as all get out and he was a very, very solid villain character. Now in book two, we have the Archon, who honestly just seems like a greedy old man. We also have Requin, who is the owner of the Sinspire, and Selendri, who is his um, lover slash bodyguard-esque. I liked Selendri honestly better because she was more interesting. Um, Requin seemed fairly 2D to me. I didn't feel like he was as multifaceted as the villains in book one. Once we got into the pirate stuff, whoo, Zamira and Ezri and all of the pirate characters were so awesome. I loved them so much. Zamira was a strong, powerful ship's captain. I love that Scott Lynch included her two children who stay on the ship with her all the time. They were amazing and really funny. And that kind of motherhood aspect to Zamira was really, really cool because it was nice to see her as this like hardened ship captain and then she would go and be with her children and it was just lovely. She was awesome. I was so excited when Ezri and Jean were a thing because Jean deserved that so much. Like I love Locke, he's always gonna be my main man, but Jean, Oh, Jean is an awesome character and I love him to death. He's kind of like a cross between something really deadly and also a teddy bear. I was not okay with Ezri dying. I was not okay as soon as that dumb bomb thing fell in the hold of the ship and Ezri went after it. I was like, no, no, no. No. Because of course Gene ha can't have anything of his own because he has to take care of Locke and so Scott Lynch kills off Ezri because it's just Gene and Locke. Personally, I wouldn't have minded having Ezri along with the two of them. I don't think that would be a horrible thing. I think it would have been just fine. But apparently Scott Lynch didn't and he's the author so I can't argue with him. There was a lot of ship vernacular in this book and I found that actually really interesting for the most part. I've read a lot of like naval combat stories before so the the language didn't really and the amount of it didn't really bother me. You know it just kind of went to show how much Jean and Locke needed to learn in order to try to pull off being a ship's captain and first mate. Now I will say Caldrus, who is the ship's captain that they're supposed to be sailing with that he's kind of telling them everything they need to know behind the scenes and helping them with this ruse that they're supposed to be this fake captain and first mate. He dies almost immediately when they go off on their sea voyage and they've got themselves a crew and then Caldrus dies and Locke and Jean are left on their own to try to hold up this facade. And you can like honestly that didn't surprise me. As soon as Caldrus went out to sea with them I was like, okay, what would make this situation absolutely horrible for Locke and Jean? Well, if Caldrus wasn't there, they have no idea if they're actually sounding intelligent or not, and then Caldrus dies. So that wasn't really a surprise to me, but I did kind of laugh when it happened because I was like, oh man, okay, what are you guys gonna do now? There's so much good humor in this story. There's so many good moments, you know, Locke and Jean kind of pulling at each other a little bit more and being at odds more just you know as the situation gets really stressful they kind of start to bring out old wounds at each other and talk through some things and not talk through some things I have book three coming I don't know what's gonna happen with Locke being poisoned now that he like come on Jean you should have saw that coming and I know Locke got after him for this too but like Really, there's only one bottle and you think Locke isn't going to sneak it into your wine, honestly. I don't know what's going to happen in book three. 
I'm assuming that they're gonna try and figure out another way for Locke not to die. I'm really looking forward to book three. I did really enjoy the second book. It has a more adult flavor as far as the main characters are concerned. You know, the, the first book has more of kind of this youthful vigor and, and invincibility to it that I think this book Locke and Jean have now figured out that they're not invincible and neither are the people that they love and Jean gets hit pretty hard in this book again and so there was definitely less of the youthful bravado I think than there was in book one. So I wanted to do this video because I have a lot of thoughts on this book. I might try to do another more deep dive once I've finished the uh, three books that are available with Locke and Jean. These are quickly becoming one of my favorite fantasy series ever. I loved Locke and I love Locke and Jean. I just do. They're great characters. They're so interesting. They're very well developed, very human, and I love them so much. I'm done. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments below what you think of these books if you've read them. I hope you guys are having a fabulous day and I'll see you in the next video.